Hey, you guys ever play What Are The Odds? The game where you pick out something silly, like drinking a bottle of hot sauce and say, what are the odds that I drink this bottle of hot sauce? And, uh, and then you and a friend say, uh, one in 25, and you go one, two, three, and you say a number between one and 25, and your friend tries to guess whatever the number is. And if you get the number the same, both of you say the same number, then you've got to drink that bottle of hot sauce. Uh, it's kind of silly, but odds are an interesting thing. Uh, and sometimes they can surprise us. You know, the odds that a male the age of 18 to 49 is scared of spiders is 1 in 83.33. And the odds of having to visit the ER due to a pogo stick injury is a 1 in 115,000, okay? Now, while honestly a pogo stick seems kind of dangerous that you'd get hurt pretty often, you're more likely to be injured by a bar of soap, one in 11,000, or a hammock, one in 85,000, or a toothbrush, one in 99,000, or a drinking straw, one in 100,000, than you are a pogo stick. However, you're less likely to be sent to the hospital of having a mishap with a leaf blower, which is one in 171,000. Uh, kind of some crazy statistics that I looked up earlier, but... Um, you know, there's a very familiar term that is out there that says the odds were a million to one. And today we celebrate someone who defeated the odds when Jesus rose from the dead. Now, I don't know if you've thought about it much, but there are a lot of people who by profession are called odds makers, right? These are the people who figure out life insurance rates, um, the odds that you're going to live versus die. The owners and operators of ca casinos where they're, you know, gambling, playing the odds, right? Some people actually make their living by sorting out the sure shots from the long shots. For example, there are people that can tell you mathematically that your car is 38 times more likely to be stolen if it's a Land Cruiser than a Hyundai, right? And if you're driving a Ford Pinto still, it's mathematically impossible for it to be stolen. So you don't need a baseball bat or anything to protect you. You can leave your keys in the ignition. It is statistically impossible. And some people make their living by figuring out odds like these, and usually they're really accurate. Yet today we celebrate the fact that the odd makers were wrong about Jesus. Jesus defied the odds. Jesus came back from the grave. And that's a powerful message. It's a, it's a message that, that literally separates Christianity from all of the other religions in the world. The mes message of Easter, the, the resurrection, is a message that can, it can change the way that we think about God, and therefore it can change the way that we live. And when you change the way that you think, you change the way that you live. This was really never more evident than me than when I became a new dad, right? Changing baby's diapers previously, I had never done it, would never do it, until it was my kid. Once I was a dad, it was no problem. It was almost like, almost like Kai's poo didn't even stink, right? <laughs> you know, you change the way that you think and you change the way that you live. Uh, today, I hope that you guys will consider changing the way that you think about your life, changing the way that you think about Jesus, and ultimately change the way that you live. Acts 17.32 says, when they heard Paul speak the resurrection of the person who had been dead, some laughed, but others said, we wanna hear more. And if you're one of our students or maybe one of their friends that's simply curious about spiritual things, maybe you're not a Christian, you're just interested in the person of Jesus, but not really Christianity, you might be asking some really practical questions, like would trusting Jesus with my life really change anything? Yes, it absolutely will. Well, committing to follow Jesus really affect me tomorrow when I wake up? Yes, it absolutely will. Will Jesus make any difference in my life? Yes, with my friends? Yes, in my future? Yes. I believe that all the answers to your questions are answered in Jesus today is yes. Easter is the yes message. Is God good? Yes. Does God love me? Yes. Can my sins be forgiven? Yes. Is there a place for me in heaven? Yes. As a believer, yes. Uh, do I have to be weird to follow Jesus? No. Okay, so not every answer <laughs> ends in yes. But the miracle of Easter is this. Acts 2.22 
uh, through 24. It says, people of Israel, listen. You nailed Jesus, you nailed him to the cross and you murdered him. However, God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life again, for death could not keep him in its grips. Jesus really died for the sins of the world. Jesus was really buried. Day one, dead. Day two, dead. Day three, boom. When my daughter was telling me about what Easter was about this morning, she said, on the third day, he woke up. <laughs> That's right. The resurrection of Jesus is God's ultimate proof of the supernatural. It's the main event of the, the New Testament, and it was the fulfillment of what, the pro, what was prophesied excuse me, what was prophesied in the Old Testament. It was prophesied, it was, it was told before that it was going to happen, that a Messiah would unjustly be killed and would rise from the dead. Ever since Jesus' uh, resurrection, there's been movements to make Jesus just another man by providing human-made theories about why the resurrection never happened in spite of all of the evidence. Different theories about as to why it didn't happen. Like, it was just a spiritual resurrection. That it wasn't physical, it was spiritual, uh, but still symbolic and important. Can you see the disciples getting together and telling each other, let's say he resurrected, you know, we'll, we'll probably all be killed for this, uh, it, it'll be, but, you know, it's going to be an important symbol, okay? It, it, it'll, it'll be all right. Guys, I did not get out of bed today to celebrate a symbolic gesture. Actually, to be honest, I, I didn't get out of bed today because church was on live stream. So <laughs> I'm just kidding. I did get out of bed. <laughs> or, uh, you know, the other theory that's out there is the stolen body theory, that, that the disciples stole the body. Okay, let's think about this for a second. The stone that was rolled in front of Jesus's tomb was roughly 1.5 tons. A ton is 2,000 pounds. Uh, and so that's a very heavy stone, all right? I lifted this stone out here in my garden earlier today, um, and it's probably 30 pounds, and I can barely pick it up. Also, I need to hit the gym again. Here's the stone right there. Boom, to prove that it happened. Um, but it was an amazingly heavy stone. And then not only that, but they would take these ropes and, and tie them across the, st uh, the, the stone and they would put five Roman seals on, on this rope around the stone. If uh, you broke that seal, it would be a capital offense, capital punishment, punishable by death. 16 Roman guards, okay, not like you know, sissies in many skirts and Harley Davidson helmets. Uh, these were like trained to defend, um, you know, men with hand-to-hand -hand combat. They took shifts. Um, they took shifts, and if one fell asleep, the entire unit would be executed. Okay, the entire unit would be executed. They'd be stripped, their clothes lit on fire, and then the soldiers would be thrown into fire. So they were really highly motivated not to fall asleep at all. These guys were Romans. Uh, these guys were Rome's elite, okay? And they, they, were, they were serious. They would not have been uh, falling asleep on the job. There's also the theory that, um, that Jesus never actually died, okay? The Roman soldiers who were experts in crucifixions made this huge mistake and they thought that he was dead on the cross, but he was really just unconscious. unconscious. Um, now, in reality, uh, there was a spear that was through the rib cage and into the heart, blood and water came out. Um, four experts would have had to sign the death certificate uh, for Pilate. Then they uh, put a hundred pounds of cloth and spices to prevent decay, which was the custom of the day. Um, and with the, cool, the coolness within the tomb that he was resuscitated in, um, and then the tomb being, uh, being opened from a guy who had been whipped, had holes in his hands uh, and in his feet, and a hole in his side from the spear <laughs> hobbled over to the entrance and moved this stone that took 10 men to move 
beat up 16 of Rome's finest uh, and claimed victory over death, people who saw Jesus could present incontestable evidence that this guy w was resurrected. 500 people, you know, saw him, okay? If it, if it were those 500 people and you gave them uh, 15 minutes each, it would take a week to prevent all or to present all of the estimates or excuse me, all of the evidence uh, that they had seen Jesus back from the dead 24 hours a day. So you, you could take all these people, give them each 15 minutes. It would take one week speaking 24 hours a day to give all of the evidence. That's how much there was. So all this to say, Jesus really died. Jesus was really buried. Jesus really resurrected and rose from the dead. And had Jesus not risen from the dead, he would be no different than any other God or religious leaders out there. But the fact that he did rise from the dead means that God has the power to make your life better today. And that's where Easter has this meaning, the meaning of Easter. The resurrection is the backbone of my faith. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 6 says, I passed on to you what was most important and what had been also passed on to me, that Christ died for our sins. Just as the scriptures said, he was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, as the scriptures said. He was seen by Peter and then by the 12 apostles. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at the time. 1 Corinthians 15, 14 says, And if Christ was not raised, then all of our preaching is useless, and your trust in God is useless. All of Christianity is riding on that one event, the resurrection. If the resurrection is not true, then, then all of our preaching is useless, useless, right? You've wasted your time clicking on this video. All the apostles were liars, and they testified based on their life and even died for, for a lie then all of your faith, faith is meaningless, right? You're no better off than some guy who worships cows or the stars or a mountain bike. <laughs> we're all trapped in our sins if this is not real, right? We're, a sla we're slaves to sin, it haunts us. It robs us of our joy. It means there's no meaning to life. It means that all hope is gone and, and that all we deserve is, is pity, which ultimately leaves us just empty. And I think worst of all, it means that all life ends in the grave. The resurrection is the backbone of my faith. The resurrection is a sign that God loves me. Right? When you're little, love is easy to get, right? You had lots of options. <laughs> but the older that you get, you make the painful discovery that there's less love with your name on it. Not too many people are forming a line uh, to make you the center of their world, right? You might call it love lonely. Um, you know, add that to a friend that stops hanging out with you or a boyfriend or girlfriend relationship is over. There's tension at the home. You can't see your friends and, and some family right now like you used to because of the virus. Maybe an illness that keeps you away from, uh, from others or that you're not in the in crowd. And you're kind of wondering, is there any love with my name on it? The answer to that question is yes. Romans 5, 8 tells us, but God showed us his great love by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Why? To have a love relationship with you. The empty tomb is an open door for a relationship with God. Religion is humanity trying to be good enough to get God's attention and earn God's favor. But with Jesus, we see a God who is reaching to humanity through his own son, right? That's not a human effort. That's a divine effort. And the resurrection was God's way of booming. I love you. I want you. I'll do anything for you. And he did, right? He sent his son to die in your place, to pay for your sins, to take the sting, 1 Corinthians 15, 55 says, Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? You are a person that is so loved, right? Whether you're aware of it or not, whether you know it or not, 
whether you're open to it or not, whether you accept it or not, God is a relentless lover of your soul. And the resurrection proves that nothing is impossible for God. What hurt, what fear, what problems are you guys having today? Because nothing is impossible for God. Matthew 19, 26 says that Jesus looked at them intently and said, humanly speaking, it is impossible, but with God, everything is possible. You know, it's, you know, asking God for straight A's or you can't find a job or you don't have the friends that you want or your grandparents' illness isn't being healed. But you really think that the God who created all of this can't make those things happen? So you might say like, well, why doesn't he then, you know? I don't know. You know, I've had times in my life where God answered my questions, answered my, my prayers in really big, really amazing, really miraculous ways. And then I've had times in my life where I've asked God and, uh, and he didn't answer the way that I thought he was going to. You know, but I've got a small brain. I don't understand everything. My thinking is finite. God is, is infinite. You know, and I don't know why, but, but I believe he can. I also believe that he has a greater orchestration for me and, and for my life than even I do. You know, I think about my daughter, Kaya, and, uh, and I've used this example before with my students, but, um, you know, having like a tub of bleach, right? It's really colorful and... You know, she wants to get into it sometimes, especially now that we got more bleach around because uh, of this whole virus deal. Um, but, uh, you know, she could try and try and try and open it and not understand why, she, you know, she can't open it with her, you know, with her own strength. And then I can walk up and I can open it for her, you know, and she looks at me like, wow, dad, you're so strong, you know. Uh, I'll take it when I can get it right now because it's not gonna have, <laughs> not gonna last for very long. But, uh, but when I don't give it to her, she could be really upset and really, um, you know, frustrated. Couldn't think in a, a million years why I wouldn't give this to her. But what she doesn't realize is that I have her best interest in mind and heart, right? I don't I want to avoid death, stomach pumping, hospital pills, all that stuff, right? And I know that God has your best interest in mind too. So what keeps you from trusting God? from trusting Jesus to guide your life? What's keeping you from God's presence so invading your life that you get out of the driver's seat and sit in the back and let God drive? You ever seen that bumper sticker that says, God is my co-pilot? Yeah, you know, how good of a driver do you think you are? The God of the universe rides shotgun? I don't think so, right? Um, I think it's more about us not wanting to give up control. The first followers of Jesus before the resurrection, like you couldn't get the disciples up, right? After the resurrection, you couldn't shut them up. They were talking about it everywhere. Before the resurrection, they were afraid. After the resurrection, they had courage. Before the resurrection, they had a questioning mind. And after the resurrection, they had a confident mind. They knew that they knew that they knew. Before the resurrection, they were seeking direction. After the resurrection, they were giving direction. Life without Jesus is simply surviving until death. Jesus wants to set you free to really live. That's the power of the resurrection. That's this, the Jesus that we celebrate. You might be trapped in a situation based on your own choices, but Jesus can change you and can change your situation. John eleven twenty five. 25. Jesus, uh, was telling somebody, telling this woman, I'm the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, like everyone else, will live again. One last thought. When the odds seem that they are against you, that's where God does his best work. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we come from a variety of different backgrounds. Some of us have 
a comfortable life right now, everything that we could want or desire. And for some of us, being stuck in the houses that we're in is the worst possible torture <laughs> uh, that we could imagine. And yet, God, we find ourselves in the same spot. All of us have been separated by the things that we have done wrong from you. All of us are stuck in situations that if we push them out to their furthest extents are utterly hopeless without you. So Jesus, today, we pray just as, just as the nature around me is transitioning from a time of death and winter where everything is dead and gone away to the resurrection of spring where there is new life outside green grass and the birds are trooping. God, would you create new life in us? God, would you forgive us of our sins as we're trusting in you and the sacrifice that you paid just three days ago on, on Good Friday, hanging on that cross? God, today we need you to resurrect us. We need new life in you. God, I pray that you, would, that you would change our thoughts, that you would change our actions, our behavior in the midst of that as we just start to act on the faith that we have. God, would you help us in that process of surrendering, surrendering ourselves so that it'll be less of us and more of you. And God, I pray that you would use this generation right now as your world changers. God, that you would use them even as they are behind their keyboards or behind their phones or behind whatever it is. God, that you would use them to impact this generation like never before. And God, I pray for those that are out there right now and they're looking for hope and they're looking for answers. God, I pray that they would trust in and rely on you. And that God, you would send your spirit to be comforter and counselor in the midst of those situations. God, we know that you are the God of life and of healing. And that does not mean that every single part of our life is gonna be easy. It does not mean that we're gonna get everything that we want or that we pray for, but it does mean, God, that you are good. You are good regardless of our circumstance. And we can trust you with our life. And we can experience true change. God, we love you. We thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey guys, thanks for joining me tonight. Thanks for sharing this video, uh, sending it to someone that you love and that you care about. And uh, we'll see you guys Wednesday night at 6.05 for our live at 6.05 service. See ya.